the memory of rainy afternoons, swingy Harlem tunes, motor trips and burning lips and burning toast and prunes. How lovely it was. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the run. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Uh, now, uh, to present our next speaker. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Novak. Uh, he's going to be talking about the assessment and treatment of hearing loss and early. He is uh, with us in the VA, and uh, he's an audiologist. He's very informative, and he's going to be a great topic. So please uh, welcome Dr. Novak. Thank you, Joe. It's always great to be here and in this room in honor of Audie Murphy. And there's a new book out about Audie Murphy I just heard about yesterday. Um, as, Joe, as Joe said, I'm an audiologist, which is a non-medical hearing specialist. And I am a uh, faculty member in the Department of Otolaryngology at the University of Texas Health Science Center, also in the Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center here as a clinical research scientist. And then I also see patients, VA vet patients, over in the Data Point Audiology Clinic. Um, so it's great to be here. <clears throat> this topic, uh, following vision, there are so many parallels to um, with vision in terms of the effects of hearing loss in individuals. Um, so as you're thinking about what you just heard in vision, so much of that applies uh, to the rehabilitation of individuals with hearing loss. Who are the folks that work with individuals with hearing loss? Well, there are a number of them, and it can be kind of confusing for the consumer. Audiologists, as I said, are now doctorally prepared hearing specialists. They typically have a doctor of audiology. Some of them may have a PhD, which is more of a research degree. Uh, but the doctor of audiology is a clinical entry degree for audiologists. And all of the folks that you will see over in the, in the VA clinics um, either have their master's, which is the previous entry level, or their doctorate. Um, and then we also have techni technicians who are extremely helpful in, in our audiology clinics. Otolaryngologist is a medical ear specialist, ENT. Otologist is an ENT who really specializes in ears and hearing. Otoneurologist is an ENT who specializes more in the neural aspects of auditory disorders. And then hearing aid dealers and hearing instrument specialists are individuals who um, have to have their high school diploma and have passed the test to sell hearing aids. Um, and they exist in the community as well. Hearing loss is really the invisible handicap. Um, people don't look hearing impaired. And um, unfortunately, it's um, endemic to our society and growing. Um, over really 35 million people in America have hearing loss that is getting in the way of their ability to communicate. Um, and it's affecting every aspect of their life. And for the individuals that we see, so many of your patients who are veterans um, have hearing loss. It's um, one of the most compensated service-related disabilities, hearing loss and tinnitus or ringing in your ears. Um, people without hearing loss rarely understand what it is. Uh, I, when they were talking about, I think my mother's faking it in terms of the vision issues. Um, our hearing loss can be the same way. A person with hearing loss may get along just fine one on one and when you're close to each other, but you put any noise in the room, you put distance between you and the person, and it's like they're um, deaf. And they're saying, well, how come he gets along well in one situation and not in another? Um, and unless the individual with the hearing loss acknowledges that they have a problem, it can be very confusing. Uh, when they're mishearing, they're misanswering, they're smiling and nodding when somebody has said something very sad. Um, and people are wondering, you know, is this person cognitively impaired? Um, what's going on with this person? And so many of our individuals with hearing loss either, number one, don't know they have the problem, 
or number two, are very shy about saying, you know, I have a hearing problem, so I just need to really watch your lips here. And truly, the person with the hearing loss is often the last person to know they have the problem because it happens usually over a lifetime. Noise exposure, all kinds of issues that affect our hearing um, really sneak up on you over time. And it's kind of like when you go up into the mountains and all of a sudden your ears pop and you hear better. And you say, wow, I didn't realize it wasn't hearing. <clears throat> well, that's the same. Put that over a lifetime. The prevalence of hearing loss is, is huge and growing. Um, if you just look at that one statistic, 30 to 35 percent of people age 65 and over have significant hearing loss. And you get up to 50 percent when you, people get into their seventh decade. So it's a big problem and often coexists with vision problems. Not all old ears are bad ears, so you know you can't paint a broad brush that there are still people walking around, typically females, um, with fairly good hearing into their 80s, 90s possibly. Um, but that's very atypical. Terms to talk about hearing loss. Hearing loss is just a physical disorder of loss of hearing sensitivity. It can occur in the outer, the middle, the inner, or in your brain, um, or all together. And we'll talk about that. Hearing difficulty or hard of hearing, that individual is hard of hearing, is probably the best way to talk about it. Hearing impaired is not a good way to talk about it because we don't want to think of ourselves with hearing loss as impaired. We just have a hearing problem. So we talk about hearing problems as that, hearing problems, or a hearing handicap. Some individuals truly feel they're handicapped by their hearing loss. Others, with the same degree of hearing loss, don't see it as a handicap at all. Um, they just have a whole different outlook on how they approach their problems, their various health problems. Um, as I said, the statistics of hearing loss grow with age. Um, so the older the individual, the more likely it is that they have significant hearing loss. Some of the symptoms of presbycusis, and presbycusis like presbyopia, is hearing loss that accompanies aging. Um, but it's really socioacusis. Um, it's more a function of living in our society. Noise, um, poor diets, um, all the things we're exposed to that can affect our hearing over time. Not so much getting old, older. There were some studies back in the 60s of the Maban tribe in the Sudan took their battery-powered audiometers out, tested the hearing of the olders in that society, and they all had great hearing. So it was interesting that hearing is not necessarily an age-related deficit. It's more probably a culturally disease, noise, and noise is the biggest culprit. Often people with hearing loss, significant hearing loss, Blared their words, and they talk with some distorted speech because they're not hearing themselves normally. Um, these are usually the S and the TH and the SH that's shh. Those sounds that are missing in their speech because they don't hear them. Male voices are easier to hear, so they often say, I have trouble with women and I can't hear my grandchildren because they're all higher pitched voices. And that's typically where the hearing loss lies. And sort, certain sounds seem annoying or overly um, loud to them. So it's kind of a paradox. I can't hear you, but don't shout at me. So there's this narrow range between making your speech loud enough and making it too loud. And that's a symptom of inner ear damage, a sensory end organ damage called recruitment. And then certainly ringing in their ears, saying, I just hear crickets, I hear a buzzing. Um, I hear um, a high-pitched sound, and it's just there all the time, and it's driving me crazy. How many of you have tinnitus? I do. And I know when it started. It was when I was using a drill, and I was too close. I didn't have earplugs, and boom, I had tinnitus ever since. Um, symptoms of hearing loss. Hearing but not understanding. That's the typical one. I hear them. I hear people talking, but I can't understand what they're saying. Speaking too loudly because they can't hear themselves normally, so they talk louder to hear themselves. It's a reflex reaction 
As soon as we put a hearing aid on a person, their speech levels come down because they're hearing themselves normally. Needing to be sounds to be louder to be heard, but not too loud. Hearing better sometimes than others. Hearing much worse in noise or groups of people. Much better in one-to-one -one conversation and when they can see the person's face and being excessively tired at the end of the day because it's just fatiguing to try to listen when you're trying to listen through a hearing loss. They can be very irritable, negative, and angry because they're just fed up. And they can start withdrawing, fatigue, depression, isolation, all accompanying unrehabilitated hearing loss. So when you think of your patients holistically and you say they're on meds for depression, um, they're isolated, their PTSD is, you know, uh, is worse, getting worse. Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder is not caused by hearing loss, but it's exacerbated by hearing loss because you can't communicate. Um, social rejection and loneliness, they often feel that. Reduced alertness. Increased risk to personal safety because they can't hear what's going on around them. They don't hear that car horn honking. They don't hear the emergency vehicle siren behind them. They don't hear the steps creaking in their back hallway with some, because somebody's breaking in their house or the glass breaking. Um, so they're at risk. They're at greater risk for those reasons. Reduced job performance and earning power and just diminished psychological and overall health. Um, folks with hearing loss like folks with vision loss are also at risk, greater risk for falls. Um, because of the hearing issue and the balance issue, you put vision with that and you've got a triple whammy. Um, when we think about our seniors, we're thinking about this huge, very um, able population that is going into retirement with hearing loss who could be very uh, much more productive than they otherwise are able to be because of their diminished hearing, if they only had hearing aids. And just as they were talking about vision, the lack of support, Medicare support, for example, for hearing aids, there is none. So for so many of our individuals, we're finding hearing aids will make the difference, but they can't afford them uh, in the current delivery system. And we'll talk a little bit more about that if we have time. Um, but it's a, it's a really a national health crisis. Um, Frustrating situations, our folks often say, you know, my wife just um, yells at me all the time because I can't, I'm always asking for her repetition when she talks from the kitchen and I'm in the family room with the TV on. Or talking from upstairs and I'm downstairs, they're just impossible situations that people could eliminate and minimize their hearing handicaps. Things that you can help people realize. Um, they're invited to a dinner party and they sit virtually in silence all night because they can't understand what people are saying. And they'll say, I'm never going to do that again um, because I might as well just stay home. They're at the grocery store, they can't hear what the clerks are saying to them, they're asking for repetition. People stop repeating, they get tired of doing that and they say, I'm just not going to do that again either. Um, and as I said, many of these symptoms can be attributed to other behaviors. They're spacey, they're senile, they're inattentive, they're preoccupied, they're snooty. Um, they didn't answer when I called their name. I said hello, they walked right by me. Um, so you get all these bad raps on individuals with hearing loss, unrehabilitated hearing loss. Have you ever felt any of those yourselves? There's probably some significant hearing loss in our room right now. Um, hearing loss is a family problem because it affects everybody's interaction with this individual. The more severe the hearing loss, then the more isolated the family member and people start talking around them instead of to them and they become less of a part of the family. So in terms of rehabilitation, just like the vision, so much of it lies on the individual with the problem in terms of, number one, wanting to determine if they have a problem, and number two, wanting to do something about it. Family members can be encouraging and say, gotta get your hearing tested. 
why are you wearing your hearing aids? Why this, why that, why not this? And the person just has to step up and say, all right, I've got to figure this out and do something about it. So what we're trying to do is bridge the gap between hearing loss and a person's acceptance of the problem and the response of their responsibility for it. So anything you can do to help your patients do that, approach this in a positive, I can do this, and there's great help out there for me, spirit, um, that's what we need because that's 80% of our success in terms of the rehabilitation of hearing loss. In terms of change, the individuals can either change the situation or change how they feel about it. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, give them tools to overcome their hearing loss in communication situations. Stay in the same room, see the individual, turn the noise down, and um, help them change how they're feeling about it. It's not a sign of aging, it's a sign of a problem, and there is, there's hope out there that you can do something about it. Our biggest goal, too, with our particular vets, who so much of their hearing loss is caused by noise exposure, explosions of various kinds, gunfire, our hunters, where are doing hunting with no ear protection, um, is to prevent further deterioration of their hearing through um, use of hearing protection. So if you can do that as well with all your patients, are you wearing hearing, are you around noise? Even when you're mowing your lawn, wear earplugs. We'll talk about that a little more. So why is it hard to admit denial, procrastination, hearing loss is due to aging and it doesn't occur overnight? Um, you lose the F, the S, the SH sounds, people are mumbling. Um, and realizing that it's their problem. Who said it? This is just some famous quotes of individuals with hearing loss. Forgive me when you see me draw back when I would have gladly mingled with you. My misfortune is doubly painful to me because I am bound to be misunderstood. For me, there can be no relaxation with my fellow men, no refined conversation, no mutual exchange of ideas. I must live alone like one who has been banished. I can mix with society only as much as true necessity demands. If I approach near to people, a hot terror seizes upon me, and I fear being exposed to the danger that my condition might be noticed. Who do you think said that? The language is pretty old style, so it's got to be way back there somewhere. Beethoven, famous deaf individual. <clears throat> Blindness separates us from things, but deafness separates us from people. Who do you think said that one? She's buried in the National Cathedral. Helen Keller. Helen Keller. And blindness, you know, when I ask my students, um, if you had to give up your vision or your hearing, which one would you be forced to give up? That Sophie's Choice thing. And they say, well, of course, my hearing. Um, and why is that? Well. Vision really keeps you in touch with everything, as we were hearing. All the good things about vision allows you to drive. Um, all the things in our environment, reading, all of the things that we're talking about. Hearing keeps you in touch with people. So it's your ability to answer the phone, to talk to your grandchildren from New York when you're here in San Antonio, um, to do all the things that enable you to continue doing your job. Um, all rests on your ability to communicate through hearing, which is the most natural way. Hearing and vision, they go hand in hand. Um, if you can't hear so well, then you start reading lips. So you need good vision when your hearing is going down and vice versa. This is just a little inventory that um, is out there that allows us to, for an individual to evaluate whether they think they have a problem. It's the hearing handicap inventory for adults, screening version. You give a yes and a four, a sometimes a two, and a no, a zero. It has social and emotional questions. So for example, does a hearing problem embarrass, um, embarrass you when meeting new people? If they say yes, that's a four. Um, a social question, do you have difficulty hearing or understanding coworkers, clients, or customers? Yes is a four sometimes as a uh, two. You go down, you rate it, and you come up with a total score. 
If their score is between 0 and 8, they perceive no handicap. If it's between 10 and 24, mild to moderate, and 26 to 24, severe handicap. So it's a nice thing to carry with you. It's just in your bag of tools, clinical tools, to just kind of, if you're perceiving they may have a hearing loss, take this out and let them evaluate where they see themselves. Sometimes individuals with what we think is very significant hearing loss come up with a handicap of eight, no handicap. You know, they just very under, um, kind of are under aware of the problem. How do we hear? Let's talk about the ear just to, real quickly. This is review for a, a lot of you. Um, it has an outer, a middle, and an inner portion. And that outer portion, the middle, and the inner portion. We'll talk a little more in detail. The outer ear is often referred to as the pinna or the oracle. And all it does is channel sound, collect sound, and channel it to the ear canal, to the eardrum. If you cup your hand up to your ears, just try that. Cup your hand up to both ears and just listen to me as I'm talking to you. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, testing, one, two, three. And you're going to notice, hey, that sounds a lot crisper and clearer just by doing that. So when people do that, it really helps. It amplifies the frequencies that are so important for understanding speech. <coughs> this ear canal resonates around two to 4,000 cycles per second, which is the critical range for consonants, like the tss and the shh. So already, the ear is processing sound uniquely for understanding speech, our speech. This, the big problem we see in our clinics, is wax. So um, helping people keep the Q-tips out of their ears, maybe using deep rocks appropriately, which is an ear over-the-counter ear wash that can be very helpful. Trouble is, you never know if you're using it, if you've got all the wax out or not. So it's very difficult to say, well, just go get deep rocks, put a few drops in your ears, irrigate it out about 20 times, and you should be good to go. Well, maybe not. The middle ear is just beyond the eardrum here, and it is an air-filled space that connects with your mouth through the eustachian tube. So every time you open your mouth, that opens and equalizes pressure in the atmosphere outside, which is in the canal here, and in the middle ear space. So if this is not working, this system starts to have problems. Where there's air, it may start filling up with fluid because a vacuum is created because it can't equalize air pressure in the mouth and the outside. And so then your eardrum starts to bulge and possibly burst, and you get a hearing loss. And we'll talk about the kind of loss you get. These are the three bones, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Sometimes with head trauma, these can be broken apart, primarily at that little junction right there, the incus stapes junction. This is the inner ear, and this is really where all the action happens in the auditory, the peripheral auditory system. This is where sound, mechanical and acoustical sound that's vibrating the eardrum and those bones gets changed into a neural event that your brain can then use to hear. And within this little snail shell are little hair cells that convert sound, mechanical sound, to neurological sound. And this is your balance system. So these are the semicircular canals. It also has little hair cells. So when you move, that gives you your sense of balance to the brain. So this is one of the balance end organs. This is the balance end organ. So with, along with the cerebellum and other central balance systems, this is what keeps you, um, your balance uh, moving appropriately. So in this, in this inner ear, then this is just a cross section showing you some of these little hair cells, inner and outer hair cells. They're resting on a little membrane that goes up and down as sound comes in there, and these are fluid-filled chambers. It goes up and down, and if it goes up and down enough, you hear, because those little sensory cells are stimulated. And it can go up and down too much. In other words, if a noise comes through here that just whops this basilar membrane, 
um, to a great extent, you can totally destroy the little hair cells that are sitting on top of it. So that's the culprit um, in terms of noise damage, noise exposure. And this is just more of the inner and outer hair cells, inner cells, outer cells, a membrane on top, a tectoral membrane, and that important base membrane that vibrates up and down that causes these to fire. These are what normal hair cells look like, cilia of normal hair cells, and this is what they look like after you've gone to a rock concert. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Yep. So what can happen is that these can kind of facilitate, fix themselves maybe over 24 hours to 48 hours in some cases, but in others they just may permanently stay this way. And so you've lost that area of hair cells due to noise exposure. Um, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, with all the kids that are wearing these uh, um, earphones all the time, are we are you seeing an increase in hearing loss? Yeah, so the know? question is with younger folks wearing something in their ears all the time. And you see adults with Bluetooth devices, you know, they're always walking around with these things. And yes, we are seeing more hearing loss in younger individuals just because this system never rests and you're getting even more amplified sound because of those devices. So we're seeing more old ears and young bodies. Is it, is it possible for us to do more PSAs or something? Because it, it just seems like nobody knows about this. Yeah, the, um, it is. I mean, public education is our big challenge in everything we do. There are some great um, professional educational um, projects. Um, Listen to my buds is the American Speech Language Hearing Association. So it's earbud and it's trying to get out into the schools and talk to, to students about <coughs> protecting their hearing and the negative consequences of loud music and earbud use, for example. Dr. Hilda? Yes. You know, probably the school nurses would be a really good target because yes. they may be able to start some type of a program within their schools. Yes, the school nurses would be a great population. And the PTAs, and you can partner with the American Speech and Hearing Association to do their Listen to My Buds program. So there's something already packaged and ready to go, and they'll send an individual out from the national office to help you do it. Was there a question? Yeah. Um, you know how so you just showed that 24-hour thing where the, the cells or the hair follicles recover or whatever? Does that happen? So should you be telling your kid to take it out? You could wear it one day, not the next. You know yes, well that's it. The question is if if they wear their earbuds one day and they don't the next, giving their ears a rest, that's huge. Just giving some rest to that system is that, helps. Is that twenty four hour period enough or it, it certainly is better than not. Yeah, in terms of twenty four hours being an adequate period. So it's it's a good thing. If they if they'd agree to that, that'd be a great step forward. You know, I'll wear it today and I won't wear it tomorrow. You know, that would be a good compromise. This is your central auditory system. So this is where the sound coming in from that inner ear comes through the nerve, the eighth nerve. So just like the um, ocular nerve, you have an acoustic nerve. Um, and all these things are very closely related, hearing and vision in the central system here. The visual pathways and the auditory pathways are very close together. Um, and so then it, the sound comes into your ear, and at that point, the two ears start mixing their information. So most of the information from the left ear crosses over to the right side, goes up to the right side of the brain. Most of the information from the right ear crosses to the left side, goes to the left side of the brain. And then they communicate at different way stations, and also then via the cor corpus callosum. So once the sound gets into the brain stem, this is the brain stem, then you get a very complex binaural mixing. And if you look at hearing aid use, it's critical, we know now, if you've got hearing loss in two ears, to have two hearing aids. Because you need two inputs, the left and right ear input, for your brain to use sound optimally. It's like, where, it's like having one eyeglass if you're only wearing one hearing aid. You lose, you lose auditory depth perception. In noise, the noise and the speech you're trying to listen to all becomes one. 
Um, you don't know where sound's coming from because everything sounds like it's coming into the aided ear. So when Medicaid says, well, we give one hearing aid to Medicaid patients, they might as well give no hearing aids to Medicaid patients because you're almost making them more handicapped, being so lopsided. Um, and of course, Medicare has no benefit, so we've got a lot of work to do. This is an audiogram. How many of you have seen an audiogram? Okay, not everybody. This, if you look at CPRS under tools, there's an audiogram section. And you can go in there and you can view audiogram and see what your patient's audiogram is like if you have access to the CPRS uh, electronic medical record. Okay, across the top, and this is just a plot of a person's softest hearing levels for different pitches. Across the top, it's like a piano. The bass is at this side. The treble is here, and all the important frequencies for understanding speech in between. And then this is loudness. Zero is very soft, 110 very loud. If all of the individual's marks are with between zero and 20, 25, the person has normal hearing. The X's typically are the left ear, and they're in blue, and the O's are the right ear, and they're in red. So this person has normal hearing for all frequencies we test them. That's great. They're in great shape. Types of hearing loss. Conductive is when we've got a problem in that outer ear. So if you have a wax occlusion that's totally plugging up the ear canal, you'll get a conductive hearing loss. That can be eliminated by getting the wax out of there. If you have a hole in your eardrum, a conductive loss. If you have fluid in your middle ear, some of your kids may have had otitis media, the effusion, and that's just because your station tube wasn't working well, probably due to adenoid, hypertrophy, big adenoids, um, or allergies. And some of our adults now have middle ear effusion because of your station tubes swell up during cedar season. Um, but anyway, conductive is treatable medically or surgically. And a conductive loss looks like this. You may have hearing loss when we test using an earphone but when we test using a little bone vibrator that bypasses the outer middle ear and just stimulates the inner ear directly, your hearing is normal. So when you see big differences between bone testing and air testing, that's a conductive loss. And if we get rid of the wax, this hearing could be up here with these bone scores. Sensory means typically damage to that inner ear, the cochlea, the hair cells, that sensory end organ due to noise exposure. This is a typical noise exposure configuration, a notch, 4,000 hertz notch loss. Here we've got good low frequency hearing and then worst hearing loss is at around four. It could be around 6,000 or 3,000 and then a little better at 8,000. And this is the signature of noise damage. And with more noise damage, this just kind of marches down the page and gets worse. Neural means you've got an auditory problem say secondary to a stroke in your temporal lobe where your kind of your auditory centers are located. So even though you're hearing great, you don't understand a word of what somebody's saying to you. It's like a receptive aphasia. And then mixed hearing loss is a combination of possibly all of these. Um, conduct in this case, the individual has some hearing loss by that bone conduction, so their inner ear isn't normal. It's not up here. They have even more by air conduction. So this individual may have problems in their inner ear due to noise damage, and they have um, a middle ear infection on top of it. So if we could get rid of the infection, their hearing could be as good as those scores um, in a mixed loss. And then you add, say, a stroke to this, and even though now you're, they're hearing better, they still don't understand the word you're saying because of the neural damage to your auditory, system, your auditory uh, cortex. And that's called the central loss. <clears throat> Any question on that? That's a lot of information. That's so a whole neural, course. Can the neural, a sensory neural or mixed be uh, improved? Or so can the sensory neural or mixed be improved? 99.9% .9 of the patients who wear hearing aids have a sensory neural loss, meaning sensory and some combination of neural damage as well. So yes. Sensory neural loss can be improved with today's hearing aids. Conductive loss improved by medical or surgical intervention. 
central loss, very difficult to improve. Typically we're talking there about talking slower, using visual cues, and talking a little louder to help minimize central problems. Question? Yeah, for the neuro one, can a patient partially have it though? Because I had somebody come in and his daughter said, well, sometimes he understands and sometimes he doesn't. He has a hearing loss, but sometimes he gets it and sometimes he doesn't. Yeah, the question was, um, that daughter says, sometimes my um, parent hears me, sometimes he doesn't. And did post-stroke, was that an individual? And she would, couldn't explain it, okay. she just brought him in. The it may be that that person is, like I was talking about earlier, if they're one-on-one -on -one in quiet and the person can see their face and they're rested, you know, maybe it's in the morning, they do better. If now they're in a family group, they're going out to a restaurant, it's noisy, you know, it's the middle of the day, it's around their nap time that they would like to be just taking a nap, then they do a lot worse for a lot of reasons. But typically the noise and just all the extraneous distractions. And sensory neural hearing loss is the most common uh, hearing loss in our senior citizens, in our adults. Degrees of hearing loss we talk about. You can have different degrees of hearing loss for different pitches. So this individual has normal hearing for 250, 500, and 1,000 hertz. Then it's slopes to a mild loss, to a moderate loss, and to a severe loss for the higher frequencies. So we can't talk necessarily in percentage of loss or in flat degree of loss because typically the degree of loss is different for the different pitches. So what do we do with the hearing aid? We amplify the pitches they don't hear well. That's what we're trying to do with amplification. Um, this is just a speech sound audiogram, and this just shows you kind of where the different speech frequencies lie in the audiogram. So you can see, and here's the leaves rustling, here's a um, lawnmower down here at 105 dB, jet engine, jet taking off, say off the runway, 110 dB, and speech sounds, this is normal conversation um, at about six feet. Vowels, voiced consonants are in the lower frequency range, so the ah, e, u, they hear pretty well because most individuals have normal hearing in that region. But it's the those high frequency sounds they don't. So they say, you know, I hear e, I didn't know if it was c, she, free, three, or t, because I can't hear in those frequency regions. <laughs> All right, this is something that I want you all to do with all of your patients. Um, whenever you suspect a hearing loss, it's the Ling Six sound test. So just have them close your, their eyes at about five feet, then just say these in different orders, random orders, um, at a normal, kind of soft, normal conversation level. So, ah, uh, can you say, please repeat after me. Just repeat what you hear. Ah, uh, e, u, Then you see what they've missed. <laughs> Typically your patients are going to miss the sh, the s, and they may miss the E, because those are all dependent on high frequencies. If they miss one of these, then you say, hmm, this person needs a referral to the audiologist. VA has the gold standard in hearing health care delivery. Um, refer your folks to audiology through their primary care person, and if they need it, they'll get hearing aids. Um, they don't have to be service connected. They have to have enough hearing loss and it's interfering with their ability to participate in their health care. And if they're asking you for repetition and they're mishearing, they're poorly compliant because they are not hearing all the information you gave them, that's a red flag. So Ling Six Sound Test. Everybody raise the right hand and say, I will give the Ling Six Sound Test if I think the patient has a problem. It's very easy. Yes, ma'am. Can you do this test with each ear? Or well, you can. I mean, you could have them plug their left ear and then do it. Plug their right ear. Give the sounds in random order. So, yeah, you could do that. I haven't done that, but that's a great idea. You could plug the ears independently and get an idea of maybe which ear is worse. Yes, ma'am. You know, sometimes 
you know, whoever is speaking to the person are speaking at a higher frequency. And um, is it helpful, like if, even if they were doing the Lean Six test, to speak, to change your frequency at which you are, because they might feel everything. Well, I'm, the question is, can you change your frequency of your voice, of your pitch? Of your pitch? You know, I could try to do that. I could talk in a higher pitch. I couldn't do it for very long. And you could try to talk in a lower pitch, <clears throat> but you couldn't, couldn't do that for very long. Probably the biggest thing to do to overcome hearing loss, talk a little louder and a little slower. We call it clear speech. And make sure the person's watching your lips. I want to give you just an example of what hearing loss sounds like so I can really commit you to the cause of trying to help people with hearing loss. So I'm going to have you kind of take a test here, and you don't have to take a paper out and, and do it, but you can see what we're talking about. So this is <clears throat> taking a spelling test uh, through, or a listening test, through a hearing loss um, that is a severe high-frequency loss. demonstration on this tape is a test. It's a list of ten words. The words have been chosen so that they are easily confused with other words that sound much the same. You will hear the list three times. Each time, write down the words you hear. For the first reading, most of the very high frequency sounds will be filtered out, so it will seem as if you have a fairly severe hearing loss. You are going to have trouble understanding the words. Even if you can't hear a word clearly, go ahead and write down your best guess. As you listen, write the words in column A on the worksheet. Here is the first reading of the list. Ready? Number one. Four. Number two. Ten. Number three. Five. Number four. Mm. Number five, love. Number six, five. Number seven, six. Number eight, seven. Number nine, five. Number ten. Mm. Why can you hear the number one, number two? Yes, so the question is, why can you hear that number and then you can't understand the word? Well, when your patients say, I hear you, but I can't understand what you're saying, or my wife mumbles, that's what they're hearing. So they, they know that in a sentence, you're hearing number one, so you've got that. It's just that word at the end, you have no clue what it is. There's no context. So, I hear you, but I don't understand you. This is what they're hearing. <clears throat> now, let's just, um, I'll give you the, the words. But what did you notice? It was perfectly loud enough for you, right? Now, you will hear the same list of words for the third time, but this time they will be recorded normally, with all of the high and low tones present. This time, list the words in column C. Number one, Phil. Number two, Catch. Number three, Thumb. Number four, Knee. Number five, wise. And we'll stop it there. But how many of you got any of them right? <laughs> no? <laughs> no? <laughs> so you can imagine, you know, a child who has hearing loss, who is unrehabilitated in schools, trying to do a oral spelling test you know, for hearing, hearing loss. Um, <clears throat> Our biggest culprit with hearing loss, as I said earlier, is noise. 
and encourage your individuals to wear hearing protection. Um, they can wear these disposable plugs that they can get at the drugstores. Um, you can reuse these. You can wash them. They're foam. You roll them up like a carrot, stick them in your ear, and let them expand. That's the big thing. Let them expand until you feel like you have a hearing loss. These are preformed flange muffs or um, ear muffs, um, which say are great for when you're mowing the lawn, doing any kind of power tool work. Um, Any time a sound is... Just hit escape. It's top left. Any time a sound is loud enough that at three feet, when you're trying to, commu to communicate, say you're out there and you're mowing the lawn and your husband comes up and starts talking to you, um, and you've got to shout at three feet to keep conversation going, then that one more noise is 85 dB or greater and is potentially damaging your hearing. So that's a good way to evaluate this if noise is potentially damaging. Um, we use hearing for several levels of, of um, our human experience. Obvious, the most obvious is communication, and that's one of the first to be Affected. When we start losing those high frequencies, we start missing words and just what you did in that spelling test. The next level is self-protection, to hear those things that are potentially harming us. And then the last part is keeping us aware of our environment, just that there's something going on. If I were severely hearing impaired across all my frequencies, I'd be sitting here looking at you and I wouldn't hear anything that's going on. I wouldn't hear the mechanicals out in the hallway, I wouldn't hear anything, um, much less you talking to me. And when you talk to individuals who kind of go through this progression of loss, yes, the first one is difficult, but often they're not aware that they have the problem. The second one, yes, if they come into a situation where they're almost hit by a fire engine that's going across the intersection because they didn't hear it, boom, that becomes very evident that they've got an issue. But it's the last one that really is psychologically the most devastating. What should hearing aids do for individuals? This is just an objective measurement that we as audiologists can take. And it allows us to assess how much amplification a hearing aid is providing across the different pitches to let us know if we've programmed them correctly. They're all digital signal processors now. The VA only dispenses the best technology. Um, and so we have this way of, of defining and tuning the hearing aids to make sure they're, they're right. And when you do that, and you counsel the individual, and you make yourself aware for follow-up, we find that we get 90 to 100% success with hearing aids. It's amazing. If we just follow kind of the gold standard protocol, and the VA has it, we just need it now duplicated in the community for um, civilians and non-VA, non-vets. What can hearing aids do if you're wearing them successfully? They can improve personal relationships, improve self-esteem, improve overall health. <coughs> And family members reported average 15% greater benefit than the wearer. So very often, it's the family members that, oh my God, finally, I don't have to repeat everything I'm saying to this person. Different styles of hearing aids, the VA has them all, and assistive devices um, that can be kind of added to the hearing aid wardrobe. So for individuals, for example, we may fit them with a digital hearing aid, but also with a Bluetooth receiver that will transmit their iPhone up to their hearing aid whenever it rings. So their hearing aid becomes their phone. And then they also have a little remote microphone that they can give their wife in the car. She wears that and she talks directly into their hearing aid through Bluetooth technology. So we've got just all kinds of great things that we can give them through the VA. Unfortunately, cost is prohibitive to individuals very often in um, the real world out there in terms of the real healthcare delivery system as it exists today. 
Um, and hearing aids are just fully automatic. They do all kinds of wonderful things. They are always analyzing the acoustic environment to determine if there's noise. Is the noise speech? Is it not speech? How am I going to change how the hearing aid is functioning based on this analysis? Is it music? Um, they turn themselves up, turn themselves down. So we can just put these aids on and the person doesn't have to do anything to them. They have become very, very automatic. Um, so the, the Bluetooth technology is the big thing. And a number of now uh, hearing aid options uh, use the cell phone as the interface between everything else and the hearing aid. So the individual obviously has to love their iPhone or their Bluetooth-enabled phone, um, which is not a good thing necessarily. But um, now hearing aids are based on that platform, the, the phones themselves. Other options uh, for individuals with more severe loss who can't benefit from hearing aids are surgically implanted devices, which are evolving um, as we speak in terms of their sophistication, cochlear implants, middle ear implants, bone anchored hearing aids or Bajas. Uh, these are all surgically implanted hearing devices. Um, there is research out there trying to figure out how to regrow hair cells, you know, those inner ear hair cells that are damaged by noise. Uh, mammals can't do that, but birds can. Interestingly, you never see a deaf chicken. <laughs> so they have damage and they regrow their hair cells. So researchers are trying to figure out how humans, how we can turn that on in mammals. So these are all, these are cochlear implants various kinds. The implant is um, in a situation where this cochlea doesn't work anymore, but you still have an active eighth nerve. That hearing nerve is still in good shape, which is the case in most individuals. So you've got a device that is implanted under the skin, has a receiver and a, a array of electrodes attached to it that then thread into the cochlea and that then is stimulated by an external device. And these electrodes then are stimulating various frequency regions of this cochlea, and which then stimulate the eighth nerve and you hear. And we can do these implants now in babies, less than 12 months of age, because our hearing testing uh, is so um, right on with infants um, that we can intervene with severe profound hearing loss before six months of age, which is kind of a critical time period for best outcomes. Um, and this is just showing you uh, another view of this, the electrode array going into the uh, cochlea. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So you're seeing more and more individuals walking around with these little refrigerator magnets on their head, and that is a cochlear implant when you see that. And as I said, um, cochlear implants, um, when they're indicated, and that's for severe profound loss that really cannot benefit from traditional hearing aids, uh, can be life-changing. So really our deaf culture, the true big D deaf culture that, that uses American Sign Language, that used to go to residential schools for the deaf, that is shrinking uh, because we can help more children with congenital deafness. There used to be a huge backlash from the deaf community, that big D cultural deaf community, because they saw us, audiologists, laryngologists, as kind of cultural nihilists, that we were destroying their culture. Um, but parents ultimately want what's best for their child. Their concern was they couldn't communicate with their child because if they heard, you know, they wouldn't use sign language, and that's their primary form of communication. So now as they've seen what the outcomes are with implanted deaf babies and the fact that they can go to normal school, they develop normal speech and language, um, they're saying, all right, this is a, is a good thing. You know, it is a good thing. <clears throat> this is just another kind of an implant that actually implants a device in one of your ossicles. Um, it's called the middle ear esteem implant. And that sometimes is used um, 
in lieu of a traditional hearing aid, but really the risk benefit I don't think is there. But it's out there. You'll hear about a middle ear implant and um, used in lieu of hearing aids, um, but it's, I don't think it's worth the risk at this point in terms of the outcomes. This is a bone anchored hearing aid, and this is for an individual typically who has middle ear disease that's chronic, a chronic perforation of their eardrum. Um, they may have, have had mastoiditis, a mastoidectomy, a big surgical reaming out of their middle ear because of the infection that has been in there for so many years. Um, and so their cochlea is still in great shape. So this is an implanted pedestal that then stimulates the skull and stimulates the cochlea. And it's stimulated then by an external plug-in uh, receiver that receives the sound and stimulates the cochlea and sends it to the ear or to the cochlea. It's called a Baja or a bone anchor hearing aid. And you can have one with pedestals and you can have one without, in which case there's a very strong magnet under the skin that then snaps up the device onto the couples of the device with a magnetic coupling rather than snap-on uh, coupling. And there are all kinds, as I said, um, additions to the hearing aid wardrobe um, for individuals, including hearing dogs um, that are available out there that are trained to recognize when the doorbell rings or recognize various issues that the hearing impaired person can't. And your audiologist, work with your audiologist. This little comfort duet, which I don't think I ever got sent around, <coughs> this is something that you should all have in your tool bag. That when you, if you do home visits or in your clinics, um, I was talking to an ophthalmologist uh, uh, last night who said when he does ear surgery, his patients are always awake in the operating area, and or eye surgery, not ear surgery. And he said he had a patient who was very hard of hearing, and he had to scream through the hole because he talks to them throughout the procedure. And all he really needed was one of these little devices that he could have put on the patient, turned it up to where it was comfortable, um, and then he could have talked to her at a normal level. So these are available in the GEM clinic for checkout. They should be available in every unit. And if you're on a unit that doesn't have one, then talk to the individual who's in charge of buying technology uh, to buy a comfort duet. And there's one on the ground there, and you can kind of pass that around. Um, and it's just an amplifier that you click on, you start it at zero, and turn up the volume until it sounds comfortable to you. Um, and it kind of amplifies equally across all frequencies. So your audiologist can help, and we can help them to correct, you know, in terms of helping you get those on your units. They would use this instead of uh, hearing aids? This is for individuals who don't have hearing aids. Okay. So one of the things I have to I have to emphasize is that of that 35 million people with hearing loss out there, maybe 20 percent of them have hearing aids. 20 percent. May I ask another question? Mm -hmm. For adults, I know that uh, some of our elders in our nursing homes they have hearing aids, but they won't wear them because they say they drive them nuts. Well, and they have a hard time with getting, getting the squawk out, with getting the the noise, the ambient yes. noise. Yes. Hearing aids in nursing homes are a difficult challenge. Would this help them? And that would help them. So that being at the unit or at the bedside, if they were you know, willing to use it, yeah. independent. Um, but hearing aids, as you know, get lost in sheets. They get, get So it's a problem. And oftentimes the hearing aid technology is old. It has problems with that feedback squealing. They don't fit correctly because their ears have changed. And so, yes, you're better off using one of these devices. So every nursing unit in a nursing facility should have one of these devices. Um, that particularly care providers, when they're making their rounds, they use them. If you're talking about compliance problems, you know, they're not taking their medications, they're not doing this, they're not doing that. Well, number one, low vision. Number two, low hearing. And you put those two together and one day becomes just like the next, and they don't understand what, they don't remember what you're saying, and they can't hear half of what you're saying. So, it's a challenge, but if you're going to try to get optimum compliance, you've got to optimize vision, and you've got to optimize hearing, um, because they're both coexisting in all these individuals. So, yeah, uh, so comfort duet. For us to, um, while I'm 
well, I, what, I'm, what I'm thinking is I'm going to call regulatory, which is where I used to work, and let them know if, if we just tell them. You yes. know, because I don't think the nursing facilities have any idea that yes. this is available. Yes, uh, and they're, they're, these are rechargeable. The company and our ombudsman, whoever, if there's any ombudsman here. Okay, here. yeah, talk to your folks who are in charge of that sort of infrastructure and try to make it happen. Okay. Because it's just a simple sort of intervention that can make dramatic That's really differences. Great. That's yeah. really great. And when the families come, you know, they can put it on, they can have a better communication. Sure. It, it helps with HIPAA issues, too, because you're not shouting. You know, you're trying to maintain privacy and confidentiality. There's no way. Um, and for families, they're talking about end-of-life sort of things, and there's a person in the next bed. You know, and they don't, they're not really free to talk the way they otherwise could. Well, right? and, and what I found is that uh, when I would survey, the people that are hard of hearing and won't wear their hearing aids, they're isolated, basically. And you can see the deterioration in uh, for, even from month to month, or we usually go in once a year or once every, yes. whenever we have a complaint. But you could, I could see those individuals kind of declining. Yes. And it bothered me, but I didn't. When I would assess them, they would say, "Oh, I don't wear those. They bother me. They, they." And I, I try to get an understanding of why they bothered them, but uh, it wasn't always clear to me because I didn't have the education to know what was. Yes. What yes. They were saying. Yep. So the whole issue of um, withdrawal and depression is huge with yes. unrehabilitated hearing loss. Um, we have a study we're doing right now. It's a telepractice study that's funded by the Center for Medicaid and Medicare. And we're training nursing students here and audiology students up in Austin to work together to deliver hearing aids through telepractice. So the, the patients then are referred to us. They're indigent, hard hearing patients who are vulnerable, couldn't otherwise afford hearing aids, from UHS, from Wilford Hall, spouses of retired Air Force folks who can't afford hearing aids for their spouse might be available to them. Um, so no, bottom line is, telehealth works well. And we can bring audiology services to more areas through telepractice. Nurses could add this to their scope of practice in whatever clinic they're in if they had this kind of training. So they could say, yeah, I could partner with this audiologist on Thursdays and we could have a telehealth clinic. And then the outcomes with these patients are just wonderful. 100% success, you know, with the 110 patients that we've seen in this project. Um, delivering them high quality digital signal processor hearing aids for free, and they have to pay for the batteries. But um, what this is saying to, to me, and to what these nursing students are seeing, you know, nurses very rarely get to see dramatic changes in what they're doing with their patients. And they're seeing these patients come in one way and leave totally changed, just in that first in session. Um, what this is saying is that CMS, Medicare, has to develop uh, hearing aid benefit. Um, and it could be very similar to what the VA is doing in terms of their remote order entry system. We just need a Medicare remote order entry system that could be developed in parallel and use the volume discount buying that passes on them very low hearing aid costs because you're buying millions of them at a time. So it's doable if we can all lobby for that. Yes, yeah. ma'am. And so what, what, is, what is the rationale for Medicare not paying? The rationale for Medicare not paying for hearing aids is that when the technology and Medicare was starting to develop regulations, the hearing aid technology was not good. And so you saw a lot of hearing aids being worn in dresser drawers. People spent a lot of money. You know, you have these door-to-door -door salesmen selling them. It was awful. It was the black time. Got two minutes. And so Medicare at that time said, we're not going to do this because it's throwing money down a rat hole. Well, now the technology is wonderful. And if you do the gold standard approach, which takes about an hour, um, you've got great outcomes. And if you've got the follow-up, at least two visits, two follow-up visits to assure everything's going well, then you just get wonderful outcomes. So it's time to lobby Medicare. We, there's a um, uh, Hearing Loss Association of America, which is a grassroots group of hearing impaired folks that have very powerful political lobby, but it really come, has to come from them, the, the consumer saying, we're tired of this. We're tired of not hearing anymore and not being able to afford it. The other issue is that audiology is not funded by Medicare. 
we're seen as a diagnostic profession, not as rehab, so we're not fund we're not reimbursed for rehabilitative work. So audiologists kind of made their money on the hearing aids because they couldn't get paid for their services. So Medicare has to change that policy as well as having a benefit. All right, that's it. Thank you. Tinnitus, really bad. One of the biggest things we can do to help tinnitus is wear hearing aids if he's got a hearing loss. We okay, find so that he needs to go to his the VA and say, I need help. We're in Corpus Christi, and he just thought, Yes, so he needs to go to the VA, say, I need help. Okay. I've got tinnitus, it's driving me crazy. Um, very often, they also have hearing loss. If we put hearing aids on them, they're less aware of their inside head noise, more aware of the outside noise in that region of their tinnitus. And they say, you know, I don't even really hear it anymore. Wow. Um, and we see that in about 60% of our patients with tinnitus just by wearing hearing aids. What was yeah. that, that was called the Comfort Duet, that rechargeable assistive listening device that you could put in your clinics, the Comfort Duet. And it's through, you can get it through prosthetics in the VA. It's just on a one-to-one -one basis. It's not through the, prosthetics. The deaf and hearing, uh, um, whatever, the, they will give those to people for free if, if they are a 60 or, or older. Okay, and who will do that? The deaf and hearing coalition or whatever, you know, wherever you go, like uh, if you go to AAAs, the, the uh, uh, benefits counselor should, would know who who is the deaf people in the area, and they have they have lots and lots of possibilities. Okay, she, so is she saying that there are resources through, yeah. often through AAA yeah. in terms of um, that can hook you up with devices. Also, you know, you can get amplified phones for free as well if you're hard of hearing. Yeah, that, that yeah. too. They give those as well. Thanks for the memory of rainy afternoon. Wingy Harlem Blue Motor Train. All right, thank you very much. Hi, it's Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the memory of candlelight and wine, castles on the Rhine, the Parthenon, and moments on the Hudson River line.